Hello everyone, Adam here, and welcome to the fifth episode of my Replica International Space Station series, created using Kerbal Space Program. In the last episode, we launched the Progress M13 resupply spacecraft to the station, and this time we will be sending up the Z1 truss, the first major external structure to be added to the station. The Z1 truss was sent up aboard Space Shuttle Discovery during mission STS-92, so this video will be primarily focusing on that mission. And while we are on the topic of the Space Shuttle, I thought I would share the Shuttle replicas sent to me for our Discord challenge. Firstly, I want to share with you folks a cow-controlled launch sequence Snackless Kerbal created well over a year ago now. He even used separatrons to emulate the sparks used to burn off excess hydrogen even back then. I imagine we will be seeing lots of us using fireworks for this, once we all have the final version of KSP installed. Next I want to show you folks Yukon's space shuttle. Now it feels like he's been working on this for ages, and I'm yet to see a full mission profile, but there is a good reason. Just take a look at this. This is a pure stock replica of the space shuttle, and it looks totally amazing. The amount of time and effort that goes into something like this is borderline crazy, so why not help foster this madness by following and subscribing? The only downside to an incredible craft like this is the 1500 part count associated with it. My PC would not forgive me if I tried to dock this with my ISS. Random Cosmonaut also shared a recreation of the launch of the Hubble Space Telescope, which is rather apt for a few reasons. Firstly, the obvious being that, like the Z1 truss, Hubble was also launched inside Discovery. But also, just last week, I spent an afternoon rebuilding my Hubble replica for a collab project with Matthew Cable, and so it seems like a perfect excuse to share that too. I would also like to thank anyone who's earned a medal on my Discord server, particularly the Endeavour medal. As you can see, the KSP community has many awesome replica shuttles for you to get your teeth into. I hope you enjoyed this intro. Now let's run that video montage of SDS-92. T minus 35 seconds at T31. The onboard computers will have control of vehicle functions. Go for an auto sequence start. We didn't launch on time, we didn't land on time, but we did do everything right. <laughs> so, so here we are on, a, on one of our walkouts, and we're told that this is actually the real one. <laughs> we're going, you, can, you, can, you might see there's a little skepticism in some of our faces there. But it turned out that it was really going to be uh, going to be go weather. We got out there about three hours prior to launch. Here I am to give you an idea of what it's like climbing up into the uh, commander's seat. And it's a good thing we have a lot of help. Otherwise, we'd still be there trying to get in. And here, uh, just we move the camera around. And here you get to get a chance to see Pam working her way in. Now the camera view is up on the front nose looking backwards. And down in the mid deck, that was uh, Jeff over there. T minus 15 seconds. 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7. We have a go from engine to start. 4, 3, 2, 1. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery, making shuttle history and building our future in space. Houston now controlling. Roger roll, Discovery. Discovery's roll maneuver is complete. The orbiter is now in a heads down position on course for a 51.6 degree, 200 statute mile orbit and a rendezvous with the International Space Station Friday afternoon. Standing by and for burnout and separation of the twin solid rocket boosters. We have confirmation of the SRB separation. Again, the three hydraulic systems and three electrical systems aboard the orbit are in good shape. All three main engines still performing well at 104% of rated thrust. Uh, continuing our way uphill, and there was a special moment for me when we passed 50 nautical miles, and I magically became a flown astronaut. <laughs> Shortly after uh, after being in orbit, the first uh, 
first thing we have to do is we have to turn the, the rocket ship that we just rode into space on and turn it into the spaceship that we're going to have to live and work on for the next two weeks. And here you see uh, a bit of a speed up of what it looks like opening the payload bay doors. They're really not quite that, uh, that quick. We get into the rendezvous uh, right away. And here, if you watch the ohms pods on the back, you'll see there's the ohms engine light. You can see the camera jolt there. And eventually, those maneuvers brought us around to this view here, and that was looking up through the centerline camera. Pam had mentioned that everybody has a job to do during the rendezvous, and that is uh, certainly the case. And everyone had a key role to do, and we all worked together very well as a team, and things uh, went just the way we wanted to. We flew around to being above the uh, space station. Here you see us at about 170 feet. We held there until we were in the right place uh, over the ground, at which it was time for us to start in. And then we closed in to 30 feet, where we evaluated that target that you see right in the middle. We determined that the orbiter and the space station were in uh, perfect alignment. There was no adjustment that was going to be required. And here's the, uh, as we're approaching for the final docking, looking out the overhead window past me. I was looking at this scene right here, because it's my job just to, to keep that centered up. And uh, to tell you the truth, I'm glad I wasn't looking out the back window. It was too close. Uh, but here we are in the last uh, couple of inches, and you can see the, uh, the two surfaces come together very well. Uh, inside, there's about a couple of seconds of uh, high-fiving and a little celebration. And then Mike looks up and verifies that the, uh, the lights, the moating lights on the uh, space station were indeed flashing, indicating that it was in free drift. Uh, Bill then took over and was running the uh, docking uh, system and bringing the interfaces close together. And then once that was done, it was time to go to work. Uh, shortly after we docked, we um, entered the node. And uh, it's pretty interesting entering a, a, a different space vehicle. You know, you saw what it was like getting into the shuttle. And it's quite a bit different when you're all unencumbered and floating. Um, we had to wait for some time for the seals to relax before we actually open the hatch. Uh, that hatch, I'm guessing, weighs a few hundred pounds, but it doesn't weigh much in space. At least it doesn't seem like it. This is uh, Brian just sort of floating right in. You see how spacious it is, no pun intended, uh, going into the node. And especially after being in the, in the cramped confines of the mid-deck, which were exacerbated by all the stowage that we had, going into the node was kind of like uh, going into a playground or going outside into a playground. As we sort of uh, one by one made our way in there, it's very easy to get disoriented inside in kind of a pleasant way. Um, the node being so symmetrical, it was tough to keep uh, straight which way was up, which didn't really matter in the final analysis, and unless you were looking for something that you had put somewhere and uh, invariably was elsewhere when you went to go get it. This is uh, Bill and I, and also Pam, working on the uh, in-flight maintenance to uh, replace the uh, space vision unit and also uh, provide the uh, contingency power. Uh, since the ground came up uh, really uh, with a well thought plan in a very timely manner and uh, we uh, could do the uh, in-flight maintenance uh, uh, really quickly uh, so uh, we could do the uh, Z1 installation uh, without much delay. This is a uh, computer graphics, it's uh, actually a bird's eye view although in space there is no bird flying so it's uh, difficult to explain but this is how we operated the robot arm to install to the uh, Unity module and actually the motion is much slower and we did very carefully and slowly. This is a camera view of a Z1. This is a final approach of the Z1 and uh, Mike was already inside of the Unity module giving me uh, guidance. And after the, uh, the installation of the Z1, uh, we started to work inside of the space station and everybody is in the Unity module here. A lot of units uh, hanging out. Again, this is the uh, Unity module. As we uh, mentioned earlier, uh, I felt it was difficult to orient myself uh, to know which direction is up or zenith or port or nadir. Coming down through the uh, through the station back into the shuttle. This is the shuttle airlock we're entering now, and you can see the two spacesuits poised for the first uh, EVA. There, uh, they had been checked out previously, and here's a nice picture of. Uh, of Jeff getting uh, Bill and I suited up to get ready to go out on uh, EVA-1, getting Bill's glove on there. Here's a picture of uh, us getting our tools um, over at the one of the toolboxes that we eventually installed onto Z-1. 
and uh, you can see in space you can orient yourself any way that uh, that'll work to to uh, get what you need done. Here's a picture of Bill getting the arm set up. He's putting a foot restraint onto the arm. He's attaching that, and then he's going to stand in it and uh, lock his boots in. And uh, he and I switch places on EBAs one and three, uh, getting driven around on the arm. And uh, here's a picture of Bill working on the uh, working on the um, some cables there. This is the um, SASA antenna that we relocated. Um, Bill's got it in his hands there. He's attached to the robot arm, and I'm assisting him there in a foot restraint. We temp stowed that, and that'll get put on by uh, the next flight to launch in just a few days. This was the part that we were most worried about on ABA-1. This was the uh, KU band antenna that we launched up on Z-1. Bill had to grab that and manually pull it out on the arm, and then uh, I helped him attach it. Hopefully this will make the IMAX movie, and you'll be able to see it in a couple of years. This was really a spectacular uh, sight in space, watching this big structure swinging out and then uh, we were able to deploy it and swing it out of the way to make room for the P6 that's going up on the next flight. After uh, EVA-1 was completed, um, you can see uh, Bill backing up Koichi on the arm and uh, Leroy's taking over the checklist and it was time for uh, Mike and I to go outside and start on EVA-2. Here you can see um, Mike and I uh, unbolting it from the, the structure that holds it, a space lab pallet that holds the uh, docking adapter in the bay. And here it's released and uh, Koichi is starting his arm operations to move it up out of the bay. Here you can see a graphic of the arm operations we had to release the PMA from the structure. Um, this is part of the space vision system locking on to the dots here that help guide it in and you can see Mike up here getting ready to give uh, directions to Koichi to help uh, stick it onto the node. Koichi would bring it around the arm and stick it over the front of the cabin here on the node. Of course, in, in actuality, Koichi doesn't move the arm that fast. And this is what's going on inside the cabin. Uh, Koichi is, of course, operating the arm and Pam is operating the computer that uh, drives the bolts and the, the capture latch mechanism to capture the mechanism. And here you can see the uh, four ready to latches lighting up, meaning it's ready to uh, be captured and then bolted onto the station. And uh, everybody's really happy because it's worked as planned. And you can see here Quichi getting his high fives for the great work that he's done. After it was uh, bolted on, uh, Mike went over and started undoing all the umbilicals so that they could be attached and I got on top of the arm to uh, move over the nose of the orbiter to uh, help attach those umbilicals. It helps to have kind of a person on the arm as a stable platform and a free floater to uh, help uh, kind of run around and get everything that's needed to do and uh, with the two of us working there over the nose of the cabin you can see uh, the cables were done. We mentioned a couple of times the IMAX camera and we did uh, do have some uh, payload bay footage from the uh, uh, IMAX cargo bay camera 3D and we also had a 3D in cabin camera. This is one huge camera and the film as you can imagine is, uh, is just uh, uh, gigantic and so it takes a lot of work uh, to handle that and you can see Pam having a little success when she's finally gotten the film loaded. Now for EVA-3 we were going to continue outfitting uh, Z-1 in that first picture Leroy uh, had just released the first DC to DC converter unit and uh, then he moved, uh, moved that around and attached it to the starboard side of uh, Z-1. We had two of those. Leroy is attaching uh, the second toolbox uh, that, we, uh, that we had carried up on the back of the Space Lab pallet. You may recall there was a kill pin located uh, right here on the bottom of Z1 attached to those two lugs. Here it is uh, being uh, repositioned over to this location uh, by Leroy so it'll be uh, uh, ready for, uh, it'll be out of the way for the next mission. And uh, then Leroy is here uh, finishing connecting the uh, final umbilicals uh, to PMA-3. And um, at this point, uh, we can see that uh, we've just about gotten most of uh, Z-1 configured. On the uh, fourth and final AVA, we were primarily concerned with getting uh, some tasks done for the following flight, including uh, clearing off the um, Zenith surface to attach the P-6 uh, trust to and then also to deploy the tray which is a little difficult to see in the picture uh, that tray has some fluid lines on it which will be connected to um, the lab first and then to the S0 truss 
This is the uh, safer. Here you see um, Jeff uh, free floating here. He is attached to a tether, which conveniently just disappeared. So it looks like he is uh, truly free floating. We tried talking NASA into that, but they wouldn't let us do it. Our first goal here was to just do some maneuvers to get um, some familiarity with the uh, flying qualities of the uh, vehicle. And then we wanted to demonstrate sort of a uh, simulated self-rescue. So we wanted to get as far away as we possibly could that they'd let us and then uh, fly a flight staying within range of the uh, person who was always on the end of the arm. And this is a shot of Jeff um, whose flight was at night. You can see his two helmet lights quite clearly. The target that he's flying to is actually the camera that's being used to shoot this video. Uh, you can see this is the hand controller module here, which is Velcroed to my um, um, spacesuit. This is the uh, actual controller itself, and you, you can see as I put these inputs in, you'll see a result in my trajectory. The uh, controller can either put in rotational or translational uh, movements depending on the position of one of the switches. That whole uh, flight for both of us was uh, even a level above the excitement that we normally have during an EBA. After, the, uh, after that fourth EVA on the next day, and uh, mostly did a very small amount of transfer. Uh, you can see again how it's fairly tight quarters in there. There is a lot of stowage in the closet, but like a lot of closets, we can't get everything we need to inside, so we ended up having to put a, a lot of it outside. Brian, in fine Navy tradition, rings the bell to announce our departure as we uh, leave and close the hatch for the final time on an uninhabited space station. Well, as uh, I talked about earlier, uh, undocking was a really special moment for us. Uh, it was sad to leave the station, but it was wonderful to see all the uh, physical evidence of the work that we'd done. Um, it was uh, a lot like the rendezvous in the sense that everybody has a job to do. Uh, I guess it's probably pretty obvious that the only time they let the pilot fly is though when you're getting further away from the station rather than when you're getting closer to it. That's all right. <laughs> um, this is kind of a neat shot because you can see that we're actually separating in a way that is, is not usual. We were uh, separating laterally. That's something that hadn't been done before. And you can see we're pretty excited that the procedure worked and, uh, and everything went exactly as planned. Uh, it, was, it was really uh, personally rewarding for me to fly the shuttle this, this way. Uh, you can kind of see I'm making actually some uh, controller inputs using the uh, rotational c hand controller. Uh, it, it's not something we usually do. We don't usually change our attitude manually, and so that was just really fun for me to see how the shuttle flew. But here, of course, you can see once again the, uh, the, the Z1 truss and the PMA and uh, the antenna. Really, really special. Because of the uh, unfavorable weather condition at the Kennedy Space Center, uh, we had uh, some extra time to uh, stay in orbit uh, and we could enjoy the uh, microgravity environment. Uh, here is uh, our commander's uh, zero-g ballet. As you can see, uh, Middeck is pretty small, but look at how uh, balanced he is. Uh, and uh, He went on and on without uh, touching any part of the Middeck. And also I had to do a very carefully controlled, uh, highly technical fluid dynamics experiment. <laughs> that was a strike. And also uh, I uh, had to do this and uh, even I could uh, throw a straight ball in zero gravity. And uh, look at how good his batting is, I almost ate it. Well, with uh, the main objectives finished and uh and the food gone, the film gone, everything else gone. It was time to come home finally. And uh, we got in our suits. And here you see the assembly line in work uh, where Pam's getting uh, right in her suit. Our entry was uh, pretty much in daylight the whole time. And as we were coming in, it was the first time I'd seen uh, the Earth at high, low altitude at real high speed, like Mach 25. And it was really flying by. But it was, uh, 
It was like the world on fast forward. And we, we came into Edwards Air Force Base on a beautiful day. And uh, we're coming in on runway 22, a very familiar sight. This view uh, out the heads up display that you can see. And we have our velocity vector pointed right on a, an aim point there, that black rectangle that you see. And about 2,000 feet, we start our transition from being on the outer glide slope to the, the inner glide slope. We're going to uh, come in to, to land. At about 400 feet, uh, which is right about here, Pam puts the gear down. Uh, and then we just make a transition from uh, from that point down to where we want to touch down and we're aiming at a point that's about 2,500 feet down the runway and come in and we touch down um, about right where we wanted. Pam put the drag chute out at 185 knots where you can see it deploying. After about 45 minutes we were out of the vehicle, uh, got out of our suits and some flight suits and came out uh, to look at the orbiter. And uh, thus ended uh, an incredible journey and uh, an incredible mission.